The scripture this morning comes from the third chapter in James' letter, starting with verse 13 and continuing through to verse 18. Which of you is wise or learned? Let him give practical proof of it by his right conduct with the modesty that comes of wisdom. But if you are harboring bitter jealousy and the spirit of rivalry in your hearts, stop making false claims in defiance of the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes from above. It is earthbound, sensual, demonic. For with jealousy and rivalry come disorder and the practice of every kind of evil. But the wisdom from above is in the first place pure, and then peace-loving, considerate, and open-minded. It is straightforward and sincere, rich in compassion and in deeds of kindness that are its fruit. Peace is the seedbed of righteousness, and the peacemakers will reap its harvest. So the great thing about being a saint is people make up a lot of stories about you. Like they say you write great prayers that you never wrote. So you get even more saintly over time. And such was the case with Francis shortly after his death. His reputation so strong that he was actually sainted in under three years after his death. Usually it takes decades to get through that process. But one of the legends that was told shortly after his death was the story of uh, Francis and a wolf. Francis uh, got a call from a nearby village in Italy saying, we have a wolf problem. Now that's not something you would normally call your local priest about. I've never gotten that call. I hope to never get that call. But Francis got that call, or so legend says. And so he goes to the village to meet with the people to find out what their wolf problem is. And it turns out that there is a giant wolf living in the neighboring forest who keeps sneaking into the village and killing their livestock. And he's gotten increasingly daring and increasingly frightening, and a couple of men who've tried to confront him have actually been killed by this vicious wolf as he attacks their livestock and runs off with their food. They want the wolf gone, and St. Francis has a reputation of having a gift with animals. And so they say, can you just tell him to move along? Matter of fact, we have an enemy village down the road. He could just move there. <laughs> this is the priest, remember? It's the weird request that we get. So Francis says, hmm, okay, I will go talk with the wolf. They say, no, no, he'll kill you. Francis says, I'm going to go talk with the wolf. And so Francis goes out into the woods, and the villagers don't expect to see Francis again. But a few hours later, he comes back to the village with the wolf at his side. This is not what they were asking for. He and the wolf, a, few dist a bit of distance away, alert the villagers that the wolf is coming to make a new deal. He wants to make a pact with the villagers. And so the villagers cautiously approach the city gate and come to talk with Francis about this wolf. And Francis explains the wolf had been left behind by his pack when he was injured. And when he healed, he still wasn't strong enough and isn't strong enough to chase after wild animals and kill them. And he was starving to death. The only animals he could catch were the animals they had already pinned. And it never occurred to him he was doing harm because he was a wolf. And whenever the soldiers came out to kill him, he decided he'd kill them instead. He didn't know he was doing harm or didn't really care until Francis brought it to his attention. And Francis said, I would like to propose that you, the villagers, feed the wolf. And I've asked the wolf in return to be peaceful, peaceful with you, to even be your defender should that enemy village send a wolf your way. They were a little nervous about this plan, but Francis, he was the priest. In those days, priests had power. He said, you don't really have a choice. This is the choice. Make peace with the wolf, feed the wolf, and he will make peace with you. And so they nervously agreed, and they would put out the food each night and run back into the city gates. And the wolf would cautiously, he didn't trust them either, come to get his food. And if anybody came near the city gate, he would snap and snarl for fear that they were going to try to kill him. But 
time passed. And slowly the wolf realized they weren't going to kill him and they were going to feed him. And the people realized the wolf wasn't coming into the city gate and harming their flock and that he actually stood sentry each night at the city gate to protect them as Francis had asked him to do. And over time they let him into the city gate and sometimes even some of the kids ventured forth to pet him. And over the time, this wasn't part of the legend, but I'm going to say it this way because I live in the 21st century, he kind of discovered his inner puppy dog <laughs> and started playing with the other dogs of the village. And they lived peaceably together for the remainder of their years. It's a great story. But the problem with legends about saints is it's hard to figure out where you fit into the story. Most of us are never going to be St. Francis. Anybody here in the running? Go ahead, I just want to know because I'll write a letter to the Pope on your behalf. But I don't know anybody who's in the running for sainthood. And so you see a story like this and you think, well, great for Francis. And most of us don't think of ourselves as the big bad wolf, right? I'm not going to ask you to confess if you've murdered anyone, but I'm pretty sure no one here is guilty of murder. And so it's easy in this kind of story to say, well, I guess I'm just a villager, maybe an observer. But if we only see ourselves as the villager, then we're just the victim, just passive. And, and I know how easy it is to see ourselves in scriptural stories, legends, that way. Because who hasn't been snapped and snarled out by someone in anger? Felt like it was a wolf snapping at you, didn't it? Who hasn't felt the harm of someone destroying your reputation with slurs and libel and slander. It feels like you're being eaten, doesn't it? Or who doesn't in these days, whenever we hear of another killing or another terrible situation in our world, wonder if there aren't wolves out there trying to destroy our souls, to destroy our hope and our faith in one another and even in God. But lest you find yourself only in the place of the villager, I want to offer you another story. And this one I have the Monday Morning Men's Group to thank for it. A couple of weeks ago they sent out an email reminding me of this old Cherokee legend also about a wolf. But this is the story of two wolves. And so the Cherokee uh, old man called in his grandson who was getting ready to go on his vision quest. The grandson was coming of age, and it was time for him to find his spiritual disciplines, to find his experience of the Great Spirit, and come back explaining who he would be in the tribe. But before he took off, grandfather called him in and said, young man, now that you're becoming a man, I must tell you about the two wolves that live within me. There are two wolves inside of me. One is a wonderful wolf. He is love and life and hope and even peace. He helps me care for the village. He helps me take care of the widows and the orphans. He helps me be my best self. He helps me love my family and forgive my friends when they hurt me and to make this world a better place and to make our tribe the best it can be. He is a wonderful wolf. What about the other wolf, Grandpa? Well, the other wolf is anger and hatred. He is not a beautiful wolf. He causes me to fear and to live in my worst possible self. It's, he causes me to snarl and snap at my wife, to be angry with you kids when you disturb my peace, to lose my temper with the village whenever they don't do the right thing and to be angry at the world for not caring for us, the Cherokee people. He has anger and hatred and fear and ego, and he battles constantly against my good wolf. There is a constant fight within me, and I want you to know that as you become a man that these two wolves will reside in you as well. The little boy looks up and says, Grandpa, what? What, well, which wolf will win? The one you feed, my son. The one you feed. You see, we are the wolf in the story also. 
We are in need of nourishment. All of us in need of nourishment. Which wolf will we feed? The epistle of James tries to summarize all of the teachings of Jesus in five short chapters. Now that's saying something. Epistle just means teaching letter, and we have like 22 of them in the Bible. But this is the one that is the most teaching. Read it this afternoon. It's a quick read, but it's a hard living. Five chapters condensing all of the lessons from Jesus' parables, all of the proverbs and sermons that he preached, calling us to feed the wolf who is love and life and hope and peace. That we might be that orchestra of peacemakers that is envisioned in this beautiful prayer of St. Francis, this beautiful hymn and song. But if you look at it, you can go ahead and turn to 406 and read it again if you want. It's not an easy prayer to live by. Just like the letter of James is not an easy scripture to live by. Be wise from above, James says. Be slow to anger, slow to speak, and quick to forgive, James says. Make me an instrument of thy peace, this prayer says. Help me seek to understand, to console, to love, that I might be understood consoled and loved. These challenging lessons are given to us to help us feed the wolf who would help us follow in the steps of Christ Jesus. Now, we're surrounded by other types of nourishment that would feed the other wolf. And it is tempting to feed that other wolf. Sometimes it feels good to gossip about someone. Sometimes it feels good to be angry when someone has offended us. Sometimes it feels the righteous to not forgive someone who has wronged us. But to all of those lessons, all of that food, Jesus says, forgive 99 times. Love even your enemy. Speak ill of no one. And James records these lessons in this short little letter so that we might feed the wolf within who is most Christ-like, the wolf who is love and life and hope and peace. This, This Jesus thing is not easy, my friends. You're all sitting there so quiet and obedient, but... Don't you think it's kind of hard? You can nod your head if you've ever found it hard to forgive somebody who really hurt your feelings. Have you ever found that difficult? Jesus found it difficult too. James found it difficult too. All of us have those two wolves within, even Jesus. Right? That's what the whole time and the temptation in the wilderness is about, is the devil trying to teach Jesus to feed the wolf who is anger and hatred and ego and selfishness. We will all have those wilderness times. But when we practice the discipline of living the teachings of Jesus the best we can, we are well fed in those dangerous times. When we lean upon disciplines of prayer, of compassion for our neighbor, of love for one another, of commitment to God, we are well fed in those wilderness times. When we feel starved for that nourishment, open up the letter to James. Sing this song, read this prayer to nourish the wolf that God has created within you in God's own image the wolf who is love and life and hope and peace. 
And when that other wolf causes you to snap and snarl, take a step back. Let God forgive you and help you move back onto the path upon which you are meant to walk. Because we aren't just Christians because we're covenanted members of Community Church Congregational or the Catholic Church or St. Andrew's Presbyterian. We're not just Christians because we say we are. That'd be kind of like saying, I'm a member of the Pacific Symphony Orchestra just because I play piano. No, you have to work for it, right? Even a member of the symphony has to practice to be a gifted member of the orchestra, to play their part in the orchestra, to be the best they can be. My friends, we are an orchestra as the church, and it is up to us whether we want to be an orchestra of peacemakers, of wolves, of love and life and hope and peace, or if we want to be a cacophony of snapping, snarling, gossiping, angry, unforgiving people. I know there's a world out there that seems kind of addicted to the snapping and the snarling and the anger and the lack of forgiveness and even the hatred. But that was true 2,000 years ago when Jesus came to show us a different way, to invite us to nourish the parts of ourselves that are love, the parts of ourselves that are life-giving, the parts of ourselves that are forgiving and compassionate and transformative for this world. In the end, that old wolf died peacefully and peaceably and was honored with Christian burial in that silly little Italian town that had first wanted to kill him. We will all reach that day when our loved ones will say goodbye to us and they will speak of the person we have been, the person that we have fed. Inside each of us there are two wolves. Which wolf will win? The one we feed. The one we feed. Will you join me in prayer? Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is error, truth. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O oh, Divine Master, grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying to ourselves that we are born to eternal life. Amen. I invite you to join me in the praying of our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. 